Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kuba Stokalski. And hello, my name is Marta Fiak. And we are here to tell you about how we, uh, how, how does the process uh, and how was the journey of designing a game uh, like Frostpunk. Um, so, who was here last year? Hands up. And who has seen me here last year in this stage? Okay, so you probably you remember what I bubbled about for about an hour. So I was trying to convince you um, that it's worth our while making worthwhile games. Um, that, you know, it's not all about just the immediate feedback, it's not just about the thrill, it's not about fun even, it's about meaning and about being meaningful. And this concept really drives, uh, drives us and drives me as a, as, a, as a designer in that it's worth our time here to do things that, that are worth our time and worth, our, worth the time of our players. And this concept of, of, of being meaningful, of being serious, important and worthwhile is really close to our heart. And, you know, the games we play and the games we make, uh, most games are really about human values, whether we, you know, uh, know it consciously or not. Uh, it's just that we routinely overuse some of them. Most of the games that we play uh, are about, um, are about uh, victory and defeat um, uh, and life versus death. But maybe there is more, uh, maybe there is room for more new ones. And there's this game, this game called Frostpunk that we made. Um, it's a really strange beast in that uh, before that we made this War of Mine and, and it was a huge success for our studio and Frostpunk was, a, was, a, was a ne our next step and how were we supposed to follow it up? Uh, was a big question for us about three or four years ago. And how many of you played the game? Yeah, I can see all of our development team played it quite a bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I played it myself a bit too. Uh, but this is a... Uh, so what, what this game is really about, it's a survival city builder game about what society is capable of when pushed to the limits. Um, it's that's, you know, the, 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 the most, you know, uh, concise way of putting it. Um, is that the questions that we pose and these things that I bolded out here for you are actually, you know, very important for our, for our concept here. Is that these are, you know, um, the, the, the survival part and the city building part and the society part were really central to our, uh, to our development process. But it was also our largest project to date. We grew over the three years of development time. We grew from five to 55 developers. Uh, working on the game full-time, supported by many other uh, uh, people in, you know, from, from office to marketing at our studio and other contractors as well. Um, and it was a hell of a journey, I can tell you that. And last year, when I was here, we actually, and I tried to sell this concept of meaningful game design and, you know, making things that are worthwhile, um, was that um, uh, we, we received a, you know, a cool question from the audience, and I'd like to play it back for you. Nope. Nope. Still huh. nothing. <laughs> Can I get a little help over here? Okay, maybe it's not that important. I'll just narrate it for you. So this was a question from the, uh, from the audience about, you know, that all of this, what I was talking about, sounded really, you know, it sounded good on paper, basically. But, you know, the question was how much of that approach of, you know, driving the design by human values will we really see in the game itself? Uh, and if it doesn't work out, if the game turns out to be bad, does it invalidate the whole approach? So I'm happy to report here that the game did not turn out bad. 
Uh, and by that, I hope that uh, by the extension, I will, I will, what we'll show you today here, uh, together with Marta, uh, that will show you that you know, this approach is, uh, is something that is worth our, worth our while as well. And it's really uh, an interesting process that we went through, because this is a really strange game, as per the words of the ever-eloquent myself. It's a really weird connection of survival city building, scenario type, narrative driven society survival thing uh, that I described it to uh, one of the journalists. And it really is, in a way, something like that. And we'd like to walk you through the steps of how we, how we actually start building the game. And how do you start building a game when you, when you start off? You could start with a theme, uh, you could start with a world, a franchise that you have to expand on. Uh, or, on the other hand, you could start with mechanics and, and, and an idea for a toy uh, and, you know, this is all of the low-level stuff that, uh, you know, uh, could, uh, you know, you, you might have an idea of how to play the game uh, at its lowest level. But the way we actually started is with the experience. We really had in mind a very concrete set of values that we wanted and, and, and feelings that we wanted the player to have. So we wanted to show survival at scale uh, in a frozen world that shows the burdens of leadership uh, in a rough loop around uh, building, ruling, exploring, uh, and surviving. And these are very fuzzy concepts. Uh, these are fuzzy concepts that we are not really, you know, uh, it's not easy to grasp how to you know, make them into a game. But the heart of all story, and story coming out of gameplay as well, uh, is, the, uh, is, the, is the conflict of values, basically. So the survival versus death uh, is at the heart of uh, life versus death, basically, is at the heart of the survival loop. And the sacrifice um, uh, of uh, good of one versus good of the many uh, is uh, at the heart of the, um, uh, at the, heart of, the uh, uh, of, of the sacrifice loop. And clinging to old ways versus adopting to new future might be described as the conflict of values around adaptation. And crossing the line versus keeping to your morals is around, around uh, leadership. But how do you conjure it all up into a, into a game? So to briefly walk you through it, there's a concept of game loops that we all know, right? We, we all know that this is a, um, that we have the, the lowest level action feedback loop designed here as a AF, is the, the lowest level interaction that we can have with our game, the clicking, the, the killing, jumping, etc. cetera. And the, on the, 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 the larger loop around it is the short-term uh, short short cognitive loop that we have to actually think and use our cognitive skills to, 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 to orient ourselves in the game world and our interactions, and they make something you know, useful with that. And even larger is a long-term cognitive loop where we have to actually plan our strategies. And a short-term cognitive loop is best described as a tactics-oriented, and, and, and long-term loop is a long-term cognitive loop around strategy. But, but then on the outside, we could have loops of emotional interaction, like we think and we, and we emote and we interact with the, with the game, or even cultural, like we think about concepts, uh, vague even concepts that, uh, that the game brings up. And these game loop levels are all map, you know, to these, uh, to these different, uh, again, um, uh, borrowed from Don Norman, uh, levels of visceral interaction, the way we, you know, click and, and play with the game, the cognitive interaction, the way we plan our, our strategies in the game, uh, and the reflective layer, uh, the way we think about, uh, think about the game. But, you know, all, that's all fine and dandy, but we still have the pro problem of how do we actually map all of this, uh, to, this to these different levels? And actually, what I can tell you is that it was all a bit like, you know, trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, and I actually give it, you know, to Marta here to, for her to uh, describe it more to you. So we had that part of the game, the society, the thing that was really important and not discovered, not too many good references, not many things to base our design on. So based on the theory that Kuba just told you, we started to build the society. The starting point was this war of mine, it worked really well on the empathy level. You really cared for the dwellers, you wanted them to be happy in that awful situation. So we wanted a set of similar, similar feelings in Frostpunk for your society. But then 
the first obstacle. Going after Oscar Wilde, there is no such a thing as a society. There's just only a group of individuals. So that was the starting point for our design process. We didn't want to design the society of a, as an abstract uh, level system. We just wanted to derive the society from a group of individuals. So we started with a lot of agents steered by AI, with the classic needs going with the mass of thing. And in the first prototype, we just put two sets, uh, the most basic one, the need for food, sleep, shelter, or safety, and then make some magic math, like usually in game design. And this made the first prototype of society in game that we had. So it looked like that, that you were playing a city builder game and from time to time there was a pop, a small question would appear like, oh sir, someone has died, what should we do with him? Should we have a cemetery or maybe should we have uh, a snow pit? So it doesn't matter. This is how the game looked like at the moment. We didn't even have the circle system. So you were just playing like that, and suddenly there was a pop, a question. And it maps to the theory. Yeah. So if we you know, wanted to look at the, the way the first prototype of the game actually looked like, it was that we had the basic economical loops in place. So we had the, uh, the, 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 the building that making people go to work, and so you could try to actually look at the values that our prototype at the time uh, sported. It was, we had at this visceral level, we had you know, basic dilemma, basic conflict constructed around safety versus danger. The game was, uh, there was already cold and people got sick uh, and people needed food. So you actually focused around making sure that these, you know, you, you make, you, you're actually the lowest level interaction were building buildings and sending people to work. And the visceral was also the visceral level action feedback loop was actually having about having versus not having, you know whether you you know decided to to send people to work and 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 you would have the output uh, or or not. And the larger uh, the, the upper levels, the short term cognitive tactical loops would focus around again having not having, what building would I put where? Uh, do I focus on coal first or would I focus on wood um, and, and expanding? And again life versus death uh, because. If I, uh, if I did not you know, attend to the needs of our people uh, well enough, uh, they would basically die. And this is actually, th the whole game was about, uh, about that. At the highest level that we reached in this prototype was the, the, the cognitive strategic loop of life versus death and winning versus losing. So that was basi basically it. But what was more interesting, and this, this was the part about survival city builder from the definition that I gave you at the beginning. So we had this, you know, you could say that there was a game there, but there was this society part that we hope, had hypes, high hopes for carrying our emotional and, and, and uh, message in the game. And the, uh, actually, the society loops were something like that. We had nothing on the reflective layer or, or strategic loops were non-existent on the society level. And tactical loops either, neither. Uh, what Marta described, these things popping up and asking you questions was basically action feedback loop asking you about, you know, making you make decisions on the values of compassion versus efficiency. So this was, uh, this was a start, but it was nothing spectacular. So like every hour prototype, this one we also played extensively. And there were some good parts and some bad parts, like always. So first, as a huge no-no, there was no player agency. From our design perspective, all those decisions were popping out by systems, so it was at random. But when someone was playing, he was like, oh, I'm building a street, pop a question. So there was no chance to plan ahead and to build something around it. And the second thing, due to probably this quasi-random nature of those questions, there was no coherent narrative building in minds of the player about the society, about those people. So that, that, that was a big nay, but on the positive side of things, we actually showed that making decisions about people uh, is interesting. So we had a new objective. First, 
we, think, we thought we should address the lack of story. And this is how the second prototype was, uh, was born, which was called The Prophet, because we put a whole story in our um, city building game. It was a scripting, branching story about the rebellion starting in your city, led by the prophet who told our people that this is way, no way to survive and they have to run. And it had a new mechanic, a call to action. There was no more random popping questions, there was a little question mark anchoring it to a specific person that you could click and see what happened, see the part of the story. Also, we came from the angle that uh, uh, it's a great moment for existentialism to be born a little bit earlier in the world than it actually did, because the horrors of the world ending under the snow uh, was a really good reason for that. And we added an aggregation of all of those citizen needs. We put a little bar that showed an average discontent. So it was the citizen needs Fancy mathematic, and then it is content that you can look at and you can see in what mood the whole society thing is. And also we added a new component because why not? It was fear. So again, we play tested it, and again it was kind of bad and kind of good, like always. So we found out that people like the story, people like to play a city builder game and have something to follow. But on the other hand, we've got actually two separate games. You were building on one side, putting all of the structures, caring for the city, and on the second, Fred, actually, you would have a story about a prophet that would pop up from time to time because we haven't addressed yet the player agency thing. And you can pick what should be next. And also that existentially, uh, existentialism and will to live and fear topic didn't stick quietly because it was too abstract in our city builder game. But we found something a lot more interesting during that prototype phase. Because the people liked the story and they got invested in the story, we start to hear discussions in the company that did you kill the prophet or did you not kill the prophet or should you kill a prophet in that situation? And that was the beginning of the one of most important things we found out during development Frostbanger that was at core of our philosophy making it, that the end justified the means, does it really? And that was a question that we haven't answered till the, el till the end of the production. And that seems really interesting for us to ask the player in that situation of the end of the world, how far can you go to ensure survival? And if it's always right to survive every means necessary. And everyone has their own personal answer for that. And that was interesting for us. And the second prototype actually developed the, 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 the builder survival part of the game as well. Uh, but not much in terms of value. There is a lot of more content, a lot of more depth to the systems that you know, run the game. We had a more robust tech tree. We had more buildings. We had a, the, you know, the, the whole loop of, uh, of fighting against cold, expanding your technology, expanding your city, uh, expanding for more resources set in. And we actually deepened it. You know, so all of these values that I just described to you previously were in place as well. We deepened it in the sense that we added a, an option for the player to actually exhort his people to get more, um, to get more uh, resources. Um, and, you know, the, the, the whole game is balanced in a way that you can't really... Uh, it's not easy to overflow with, uh, with resources, so it's, it's of this conflict of making do versus extreme scarcity. But more interesting things happen uh, in the society loops. So I actually, by developing these, uh, this, um, uh, the, this concept of the profit and exp expanding on the narrative side of the game, we actually, you know, saw more values popping up into the, again, the visceral level of the game. So in addition to the, to the existing decisions about you know, how to treat for your people, uh, we also had the, 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 the still vague and coming about after a very long play, uh, play session, relatively speaking, but we had more interesting uh, conflicts, such as crossing the line versus keeping to your morals. You know? Where is the line and when you personally as the player would, would, would draw it? And good of one versus good of the many. 
You know, is it okay to sacrifice one person so that, you know, your idea of survival and your idea of, of shaping this society would, would actually hold up better? And these were, you know, these were the more uh, interesting and more unusual, uh, unusual values and unusual decisions and emotions to pop up in gameplay. And that was the reason, you know, why, um, and it all worked like Marta described on the, um, uh, in, in this level, but actually placing all of that on the visceral level was really not something that we wanted to stick around with. It's just basically, you have these decisions, these cool moments of, you know, deciding about these things here, but then you would, you know, just close them down and go back to these long-term cognitive strategic loops of planning out your development of your society, the development of your, of your buildings, development of your techno technology tree, et cetera, et cetera. And make no mistake, these are interesting and this is good gameplay, right? All of this uh, on, on the previous slide uh, here, this is, these are classic gameplay conflicts, right? Whether you win, whether you lose, whether you live, whether you die, how you expand, etc. So there's good gameplay to be had on that, engaging, good engaging gameplay. But we wanted to have something more some strive for something more meaningful. And this was our path forward. So again, we played extensively and we found new objectives to tackle in the next prototype. First, we still haven't addressed the player agency thing. The player couldn't uh, plan ahead, couldn't traverse the play space in his head to know when he, where he was going. Also, so we need stories because they were fine, but shorter than profit and not make your own, make your own adventure kind of thing, more a system driven thing. And the most important fact, we wanted our content and everything what we add to the game from that point to support that question if the means, if the end justifying the means. So the prototyping phase started because the game was more advanced at this moment and testing if everything inside was uh, getting hard and we have to put it to a good, um, good quality so it's not pop. So we started to do Unity prototypes so we can click around them to see what decisions are fine, what decisions are not and how we can interact with uh, them in the game. So. We prototyped, again, still it in Unity. We started to have that tree structure, a little bit technology tree, so we tried different approaches, but this one was really good and readable. So we put it in the game and made it more pretty, and finally we ended with something like that. And again, everybody was playing, everybody was giving us feedback. So, again, the A part, the player agency was there. People started to play like, hmm, I will make this decision and the next one will be this and the, in the next playthrough I will switch the, the roads I will do. So I will work around that. That was a system to play with for the player. And people really liked the laws. But there was still not enough narrative building in the player's head. And okay, we haven't addressed that yet fully. But the new thing that was interesting was that people liked the laws, but didn't like how they were connected with each other, which was strange. So we started reading and we found out about something that's called boiling frogs and why it's important how the laws are connected. So. So the boiling frog, actually, this prototype enabled us to actually shake up the society loops a bit. As you remember, all of the values that we, you know, uh, build out around, uh, around the game uh, in the previous prototypes were on the society layer, were focused around the visceral action feedback loops, so basically decisions in the moment. And actually implementing something like the Book of Laws and throughout these different steps that Marta just showed you, it actually enabled us to push these values into different loops for the player. So the player actually could try to strategize about different things than what cool new technology to develop next, right? He could try to strategize about, you know, how far am I willing to go to ensure that, you know, I actually successfully complete the game? Uh, how compassionate can I be in the short to midterm for my people to actually, you know, withstand the the, the, the recent cult, uh, cult snap or, uh, or you know, how, I'm, how far am I willing to exhort my people to get ahead um, in, the, in the economical loop. 
So these were really interesting, interesting notions. But like Marta said, they all amounted to something more. Like the, 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 the hint that we had that people didn't really, you know, feel the way the, 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 the laws were connected in the tree gave us a hint that there is a possibly a new, really cool um, a concept to be, um, to be f exploited here. And that's the boiling frog. So what the hell is boiling frog and what this frog is doing in the pot? Boiling frog is a tale from sociology. It's a tale about boiling a frog, how you can imagine. And it says that if you put a frog into boiling water, it will jump out and survive. But if you put the frog into water and gradually increase the temperature, the frog won't find out what's happening and will die. Of course, on the biological side of things, this is bullshit. Frog will run away. But the important part of the story is about how small gradual uh, changes can put you in a state of total institution, totalitarianism, for example. So how it works, you take small laws that are getting gradually harsher and harsher and harsher, and suddenly, this is not the country you loved and believed in. So, what have we found out uh, so far? We got that key question that we wanted to support no matter what. Does the end justify the means? We found that key concept, that creeping normality, that boiling frog is important and it can show a really interesting process that is happening and has happened, have been happening for many years around the world. And we know that short stories are good and we have the player agency. But we, if we want to support that boiling frog and that shaping society part, we have to have permanent change in our people. And, of course, on the same platter we will put the short stories and make two things at once. So we start adding consequences to the law. When the player enacts a law, then in some time in the future, if certain conditions are met, a small consequence story will appear. It's sometimes one text, sometimes three, it's sometimes a branching narrative, but nothing huge, nothing like profit. And we will still remembering about that empathy part from this war of mine. So we wanted to show those laws, how they affect an individual and what it means on a level of single person. But we added a lot of them uh, in the game and we found out that we have a new problem, a huge problem about tone. Because it was a picture and it was a text and there were some um, choices to be made that changed the systems. But how the text was written and what the picture showed was really, really important in that situation. And we tried extremely subtle ways and then it was fun, but only for designers because it was all on meta level and it was alienating for everyone except us. And on the other hand, we tried to go hardcore, explicitly graphic, showing really edgy stuff, which was also a awful idea because it was cartoonish and was breaking the immersion and the players were like, yeah, they're just trying to push it and push it and it lacked the emotional gravitas. So iterated a lot till the very end of the production to put it uh, in a good way. Here you can see uh, one of the progressions for our fate creepers. There were parts when they looked really nice, like nice priests. There were moments where they looked more like BDSM lovers. So we really tried to find the right tone for everything and it took a lot of time. But those stories, those progressing gradual stories wasn't the only thing to show the change. We received a huge amount of support from art and we iterated a lot together also on other parts to show uh, with a lot of bivalent, oh, I don't like that word, whatever, to show on the pictures and in-game graphics how we progress from that to that, for example, because we've got two ways uh, in the game. And to finally to finish with something like that, uh, when everything you see here is uh, system driven, so you can build up that creeping normality to the biggest decision the player can face, the breaking point 
when you just say no more bullshit, this is a totalitarian state or this is a fanatic state, and you sign this law, which is a uh, really harsh situation, uh, and it changed the mechanics quite drastically. So to recap, what we have so far, we've got that quick uh, key question, does the end justify the means, the creeping normality, we had a new thing, a permanent change in our people, both in narrative and in visual, and the player agency and those short stories that came out of it. But do we really have the emotions we are fighting for? It was quite hard to empathize with 500 people. It wasn't this war of mine, and we're starting to realize the empathy part, it's not going to work, probably. But then, during playtest, and that, that was the moment to start uh, tests with players from the outside, we found something new, found something really interesting from our perspective. Not the moment, uh, not at the moment, empathy, like in this war of mine, but something that we call post-playthrough reflection. When we talked to the players, to the testers, after the game, they were like, I don't know if that was the right choice. I, I don't know if that was the moral thing to do. When I was playing, it, it was obvious to do it, we have to survive. But after that, they were reflecting on those decisions that they made, if they were moral, if they were right. They were not empathizing with those little people. There was too many, uh, there was too many of them. But they were thinking about the choices in a more broader spectrum. And that was a great thing for us. And from that moment, we started to support it as well. In many things, in the small content changes, but the bigger part was the highly controversial end lock of the game that uh, actually just show you what you have done. That's all. We show you how the city grew. We didn't tell you what laws were bad, what were good. We just show you what you have done during this playthrough, finishing with one statement if you have or have not crossed the line. And uh, players started to argue with that and think about that if they did it or did not. And that was really important for us to support this concept. So in the end, during this iterative process, we found the most important parts of our development. The key question, does the end justify the means? The key concept of creeping normality, also known as the boiling frog, and the key concept of post-playful reflection. And actually, if you look at the uh, society loops that we ended up with, uh, more or less, it's we managed to push, thanks to the concepts such as Book of Laws, uh, thanks to the concepts of, uh, to the mechanics of, uh, of consequences, we managed to, you know, show you the, uh, the crossing the line and all of these different value conflicts on the higher levels, not just on the visceral or the shortened cognitive loops that you, that you have when interacting with the game. But w w what we hope and what basically feedback tells us that we somewhat achieved is that we managed to push a bit into this reflective layer of emotional and cultural loops that, you know, what does crossing the line actually mean? Uh, and it might be, you know, a small thing to ask yourself after a game, just think about it for five minutes, or you might spend, you know, hours and hundreds of posts uh, arguing about it on the internet, as we actually have, uh, with regards to one of the controversial lines in the end lock, asking you whether, you know, whether it was worth it, that what you just did in your playthrough. And it was actually our... Uh, we hoped we could we could we could reach that level. Uh, we hoped that we hoped that we could show you content that's built around not just your usual you know winning losing uh, fighting uh, losing or you know surviving dying uh, conflicts that are you know present in many many games, but actually reaching out into this non uh, non uh, non usual non uh, unusual and, and non non, non cliched um, concepts of of asking these questions. And we really hope that we that we uh, that we you know manage it at least at least in some part. And did we nail it you know completely 100%? Well, obviously not. Well, there are you know very nice and and, and warming or hearts con uh, comments on the internet, such as you know, Frostpunk treats people with disabilities as complex humans and not gimmicks. Or 
have emotional decisions, put a human face on the citizens of your frozen colony from IGN. Or uh, even more, Frostpunk is among the best overall takes on the survival city builder to date. Uh, its theming and consistency create a powerful narrative through the line that binds your actions around the struggle to hold on to your humanity in uncertain times. Well, these are the quotes that we, that we really crossed our fingers to hear when we, when we released the games. But not everyone bought it, such as this comment here. Frostpunk may be one of the most uh, tense, exciting city-building survival games on PC, but for a game with so, such an emphasis on innate justice and heat, it leaves you surprisingly cold. And we think, basically, that there is a, you know, when you focus on the post-playthrough reflection, on, on, on relying on your player thinking about the game uh, and, and having enough of an, uh, the, the content of the game having enough of an impact on the players to actually think about it in the game, then obviously some of your players, you will lose some of them in the sense that some of your people, some of your players will not, uh, will not go that deep uh, into the content, into the experience of the game. But obviously, you know, as the, as the, as the previous comments show, some do, and, 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 we, and hopefully them uh, are happier for it. But obviously, there is room to do it even better next time, <laughs> right? So, Basically, what we would like to show you, uh, to, to tell you today, and what I'd personally like you to, to go, go away with from this talk is that, uh, you know, if you think about putting non-trivial content in your game, uh, you basically have to, you know, be sure that you are mindful of what your game is about. And I'm not talking about whether it's, you know, fantasy, science fiction, elves versus orcs, or space marines, whatever. This is, from the design standpoint, from the meaningful game design standpoint, this is, you know, secondary, right? You could have a game about survival, uh, citizens surviving in a war-torn city, such as this War of Mine, and you could have a fantasy game, such as Frostpunk in a you know, post-apocalyptic frozen world. Both of those can be about something, you know, reaching deeper into the human condition. So if you want to build this, you have to, uh, you have to be mindful about it, because like I said, you know, last year, your game will be about human values. You know, whether you like it or not, if you're making a match three game, this game will be about winning or losing at the very least. So you can either consciously design it and be mindful about it, or you can, you know, forget about it and just focus on the, uh, on, on the, on the fun and the, on, on, on the low level, you know, visceral feedback stuff. And this is, for some games, it's fine. I just hope, and what I personally think uh, is true, looking at the marketplace, looking how competitive it is, how many games come out each day, is that we are slowly reaching a point where Games that are just fun is not enough. Where we, re where we reach a point where collectively as, a, as, as an industry we've matured enough that we have a common and, and good enough grasp, or grasp on our craft that we can make good games if we put our mind and our heart to it. It's that moment where, you, where the content and what you show your people, your, your players, what you show your, and what you ask your players actually starts to be an advantage and the core point of your game. So just to compare it to movies, it's just not enough, you know, that movies use editing, right? Movies have to tell a story about that will that will speak to human heart, right? And and to human soul and to and, and to your to your mind that you'll think about. These are the stories that win in the end. So you have to design the values. Do not leave them to chance. And you know, starting with something like that at the beginning of development might be an overwhelming task, and it was certainly for us. It all sounds pretty and, you know, uh, nice when we lay it out like that today, but I can, you know, assure you that it was far from it during development. It was a, a lot of hard work, a lot of missed ideas, a lot of things that did not work, but through iteration and through, through being mindful about what, we, what experience we want to have, and by extension, what values do we want to show uh, to the players, uh, what values do we want them to experience, uh, we were actually able to arrive at something that that we hope and we think is more than just, you know, entertainment. Um, and this is a, uh, if I had sound, I would play another question from last year here. Do I have sound? I don't. So I will narrate it to you. Uh, because there's one elephant in the room, obviously, when I, you know, talk about all these high concepts here, it might sound great, but, you know, the, another very good question last year was, does it sell? Well, I'm happy to report that it does. Uh, Frostmonk sold really well in 250,000 copies in 66 hours, so it does sell. But 
for me as a, as a designer, it's not really the most important thing. Of course it is. It all gives us jobs in the end, so, so it is important. But as the, um, me personally, as a creator, I think that it is really, it would be a shame if we wasted our days and, and the days of our, and, and the time of our players on, or just on the things that are, you know, trivial, trivial amusements. Don't get me wrong, trivial amusement is important. To lay back, to, uh, to, um, uh, to rest, uh, and, and to, to lay your mind to, to, to rest, and to just play with something fun. This can be meaningful as well, if done well. And I just think that we can actually try to uh, aim for something more in the mainstream, you know, the big budget, the, 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 the thing that reaches many, many players, um, and, and ask them to spend their precious time uh, on our game. Uh, because ultimately, I think, and I hope Marta does not disagree with me, uh, that it's just simply this thing is it's worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? Do we? If we have any questions, please come down and join us. Okay. We won't bite. We, oh, we will. Oh, yeah, some <laughs> of us do. We're not talking about you know, all of this fuzzy stuff all the time. You can ask the nitty gritty as well. <laughs> There's a hand up in the air up there, but <laughs> I'm not sure we can reach it. Hi, uh, for start, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, this game and this presentation, it's uh, actually it was the uh, only title that drove me away from playing God of War for like 20 something <laughs> hours, so that's something, right? Achievement unlocked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'm wondering, uh, are you planning to do some survival endless mode or something like this? And how would it impact the current uh, assumption for design? Uh, with the response that we got on uh, on on game day uh, and with the you know how how well the game did we will definitely support the game and actually addressing you know the longevity uh, question that many players have is uh, is high on our priority list we are not we can't really you know said and reveal anything concrete just yet but but you know the way I think that is, you know, this, for instance, the question about, you know, just the survival, the endless mode, this is an interesting, um, interesting um, concept because it comes mostly from people who are focused around the city building, at least what, you know, yeah, you're, you're nodding your head, so probably you just enjoy building out your city and playing the city builder stuff. Exactly. Yeah, so <laughs> this was actually an interesting point that we, for brevity's sake, we omit, omitted in the presentation because during this development we had a really tough time marrying survival gameplay with city building gameplay as well. Because these things uh, have very, players of these types have very different motivations. City builder players just want to have, you know, a lot of time, a lot of space just to play with the toys. And survival gameplay, you know, makes you tight on budget, tight on, tight on time, making hard decisions. So it was, you know, it was a difficult thing for us to do. And addressing something like a sandbox mode and survival mode will be, will be a difficult task for us to, to just do, just like that. But the way I see it, if we add a mode like that, it will be more like focused on the, on the gameplay, just the, you know, the lower level loops, like from the action feedback to the strategic layers. Because the way I see it, the, the higher level uh, emotional loops, we can reach in the, in the more tightly controlled um, scenarios that we arrived at, and the structure of the game is no, is no accident, right? We arrived at this novel-like structure of relatively short stories that we tell because they allow us to, you know, reach this, this more, um, this higher levels of the, of, the, of, the, of the higher level loops. And doing that in an open-ended mode will be, will be difficult. Okay, thank you. Hello, so I'd like to ask, when designing for a game that is supposed to be meaningful, that's supposed to convey certain values, do you take into consideration 
the possibility of an outright conflict of ideas between either the people in the team or later on between the vision of the team and the players? So the thing is, uh, that's a thing between us. I designed the society, he's the lead, and we don't agree on most of the questions. We don't agree if the survival just to find the means and all of that. We have really, really different outlook on that thing. Uh, and I think it's a good thing in the development process because we did things to support both of the play styles. And there are stories in the games that support my point of view, there are stories in the game that support his point of view, and there are things that came out of that conflict. And I'm afraid that if you are too homogeneous in your team, that the game will just change in a propaganda for one way of doing something. Well, propaganda so, might be a bit, big word because yeah. you as a creator might have an idea of you know, making a... Propaganda. Making, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, well the, the, the strong point of games is that actually the final story, and I mean the story in the broad sense, you know, the coming from, the, from gameplay, the story is in the end created by the player, right? So, so the, the control that you have is, uh, is for the content that you provide him. So if you want to have a...